time we can get started. Hi, my name is Callie Dolphy, and I am a Data Science in Red Hat's Open Source Program Office. And today we are going to be talking about community metrics and really breaking down what to measure and why we want to measure them. So we will be discussing today first, what is the value of community metrics and what can that bring? Second, we'll be going into the methodology behind generating community metrics. And lastly, we'll be going into the analysis lessons learned and the things that I really would like you to leave today with whenever you're going about creating your own community metrics. So first, what can strong community metrics enable? It's really great going into keeping up with our communities and the others that we care about. I'm not here to tell you that data analysis or automation is going to be the one thing that informs your community decisions. It's actually the opposite. This is to build on your own open source community knowledge or incorporate others. Maybe you have somebody on your team who is really good at establishing community initiatives or meetups and there's another person who's great with CI, CD. Whenever you collaborate together on metrics, you can start to incorporate everyone's unique perspectives and start to take those into account. The next, we all have a thousand and one things to keep up with every single day, and it never feels like we have enough time. If getting an answer about your community is going to take 10, 15 hours, you're not going to do that regularly, if ever. And last, there is so much data around repositories and every single aspect of our, of our communities, IRC channels, all of the above. It can be really overwhelming trying to consider, okay, I have all of this information, there's so much pr pressure to be data driven. How do you take all of that and pick out the little needles in the haystack to figure out what's going to bring you value? So, first thing we wanna consider is what perspectives we want these metrics to gain or to bring to you or to share. The first is considering whether we want it to be informative or influencing action. Is there an area in your community that is not really understood and you're trying to take that first step of getting there? Or is there an initiative that you're trying to decide on or measuring an initiative already in place? Next is looking into whether we want to expose areas of improvement or highlighting strengths. There's gonna be times when you're just trying to hype up your community and show it how great it is especially when you're trying to show business impact or advocate for your community. But when it comes to informing yourself and trying to decide what areas that you're going to prove, identifying shortcomings is where you're gonna get the most value out of your metrics. There's no problems with highlighting strengths, but there's a time and a place. Don't use metrics and visualizations to be the yes man inside of your community to always tell you how great you are. But there is times for it, and sometimes a morale boost or recognition for what people are doing great is also important. The last list we're gonna look into is trying to go from either community impact or business impact. The languages that many businesses speak is numbers and data, and it can be incredibly difficult at times for advocate for your community without having this behind you for people to listen. It can be a good way to bolster your points and kind of, like I said, meet them where they are. But there's also, we want to show your impacts of your community in the open source ecosystem in general, or how your, the community aspect impacts your code. With all of these, it's not always an either or situation of what you're going to get out of your metric, but framing what your goal is, is going to make it where you have a much more deliberate visualization whenever you're trying to establish your goals. Now we're gonna take a little bit of a step back from just looking at community analysis to data science as a whole. When talking about d general data science or machine learning work, some version of this workflow is what you're gonna see people describe. For this presentation, we're gonna be focusing in on that first step, codifying metrics, problems and metrics with a little bit of a splash of the second. If we're looking at this from a data science perspective, this presentation can be viewed almost as a case study of these first two steps. And these steps are often overlooked. It's actually one of the main um, inspirations of this presentation. But the true value of your metrics can come right here. You don't wake up one day and just know exactly what you wanna, wanna look into. So let's go into the true focus here, codifying problems and metrics. 
I know tooling is something that people love to debate, and I am one of them, but that is for another time. Come talk to me afterwards, and I would love to go into it. Um, but we're really going to start to break down here. Let's truly start figuring out what you want to know, then going into what data that you have, and get us to our true goal of thoughtful execution of data analysis. So let's go into our analysis angles. These are going to be some different scenarios for metrics and visualization building. These angles are the on, not the only ones, but just the main examples for, these to, for this talk. And they can be applied generally. So let's go into our first scenario. So let's say you've already done a little bit of data analysis. You've gone down this path. You started looking at things maybe like the number of contributors over time or commits. You kind of started to figure out what's generally useful for your community. So let's look at the number of contributors over time. Say you know that at this point you have 150. That's great. You know that these are the amount of people that have been in your community over time. But how can we take this a step farther? What if we decided to break it down into active versus drifting contributors, where active is somebody who's been has done a commit or some type of contribution in the last month or two. You can put that whatever time interval you would like there. And drifting is somebody who has not. You can start to see the breakdowns and breakdowns in your community. Is there a large group of people leaving? Is there something going on there? Um, or is your active contributor base staying strong and consistent? Another breakdown of this is looking at repeat versus flyby contributors of the time. With flyby, we're defining as somebody who's done less than, we'll say for this example, four contributions. So whenever somebody comes into your community, how many people are actually becoming active members versus somebody who is coming in, maybe opening an issue to, making a comment, and then leaving? And so you can actually get some, some real insight into what these contributors are doing. Another example of this is commits over time. Say this month you've had 100 commits, and the next month you've had 40. It gives you a little bit of something, but let's try to go a step further here. So what about the depth? We can look at the depths of commits over time. Maybe in those 100 commits, you've only had, I don't know, a couple hundred lines of, you had a couple hundred lines of code changing, saying that that's something you really care about is looking at lines of code, versus that 40 commits was changing thousands of lines and many different files. That can start to tell you, do we need to put some more maintainers in here? Do, is there some analysis that we need to go into to make sure our code base is still stable after such a large amount of change? Another way we could look at this is commits by a subset of contributors. Is your repository deeply dependent on a small group of people? Is that something that is sustainable? Is that number that you're trying to change? This can really take from just knowing, OK, we've had 40 commits over in the last month to some more deeper analysis and insight on your community. And so this next scenario is going, we're going to go into is community campaign impact measurement. That's a lot of words. Let's break that down a little bit. Let's say that your community is trying to establish a meetup or some type of um, initiative around bringing in new contributors. How do you start to view your impacts and your goals around these initiatives? And these two steps actually feed into one another. And let's discuss why. Once you establish your campaign, goal, um, campaign goals, you can start to determine um, what can be measured and to detect impact. With that, figuring out what can actually be measured can feed into act, to establishing the goals of, cam of the campaign. It's easy to fall into the trap of being a little bit hand wavy and not concrete with your goals, and that can be really hard to make substance of being, knowing that substantially, if your impact, your give me a second, your campaign is making an impact. Um, of an example, I really like to go with here is some work that I've been doing with the Fedora community. Um, they have a goal of doubling their contributor base by 2025, which seems like a pretty straightforward goal. But with that, I started discussing with them, what is considered a contribution? Is it just a code commit? Is it a website change? What actually counts for you? And where do you want to look at this? Is there only a subset of repos? Is there 
chat rooms? Like, what do you actually care about whenever it comes to doubling those contributors? And so defining what we want to look at can actually help going towards the establishment of this initiative, knowing how you want to go about this, where you want to um, bring your efforts. And so this scenario three is where we're going to be spending the majority of our time here as a lot of the prior examples can be viewed as different parts of this workflow. This is a living cycle, and improvements and extensions can always be made. And whenever you get to that point, you can decide on whether spending time towards those improvements are worth going into deeper. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty big on the examples. We'll first walk through this as at a, like a theoretical level and then go into an in-depth example. So. First step here is breaking down your focus area. And this is when you want to bring in the perspectives that we talked about earlier in this presentation. I like to think about this process in, th in three parts. First, let's think about the magic eight ball. I don't know if you all ever had this toy as a kid. It was a plastic eight ball, and you could shake, shake it up and ask something like, am I going to win my softball game today? And it would give you some result, like absolutely or definitely not. Um, and so what I like to think about here is, let's think about your analysis area. If you could get any answer right then and there, what would it be whenever there is no limits? Once you have that question, that thing that you would really love to know, let's talk about the data. From your magic eight ball question, what are any data sources that could potentially have to do with that question or more generally that focus area? and really cast out your net wide. I think that one thing that's really helpful in this step as well is establishing how accessible this data is. If it's repository data from the GitHub API, that's gonna be a little bit more clean, a little bit more accessible, or if maybe you're looking at your IRC data or some type of um, chat room, that's gonna take a little bit more cleaning. Both are good to establish, but it's also good to take into account how much time and effort it is to get that data into the point where you can make analysis. And so, now with the context of your data and your large scale goal, what are some sub questions that can be answered to bring you closer to that proposed eight ball question? You're kind of taking in these questions and saying, okay, with this data, what can I answer directly? And they don't need to all add up together to get to your big grand goal. It's actually sometimes better not to because if you're trying to piece together maybe four or five different visualizations, you're like, okay, this brings me to my goal you really need to take apart the assumptions that you're making to say, okay, these all plus, 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 plus equals that. So there's this things to take into account. So next, we're gonna be going into converting each of those sub-questions into a metric. And this is a process that you would repeat for each of your sub-questions. So first, for each of the following proposed questions, first, you're gonna wanna select the specific data points needed. So even if you're saying, okay, all of the GitHub, all my GitHub data, are you trying to look at contributors? You're trying to look at issues and, and, what, and what attributes of those are you trying to look into and want to integrate into your visualization or metric? The next thing you want to consider is how do you want to represent this data? Is it a bar graph? Is it a percentage? Is there means, like really trying to break down, okay, now that I have this data, what is the best way to aggregate it to get us to the insights we'd like to have? Last step here is to try to make hypotheses of the insights and actions that you would like to come from this. Because I think that can also help with the process that we'll be going into next. Once you have that first work in um, progress metric, you're gonna kind of go into a repeat proce process that could go on forever. When you have that, that first metric, this is when you wanna go and start getting some more larger community feedback. Your biggest skeptic that is going to pick it apart, that's who you wanna bring in here to really start asking questions for you can go and start improving on this first go around of metrics. Now I can say many times the best ideas come from showing an initial metric and having someone be like, oh, what about this? It's actually something that's happened multiple different times during this conference, just in hallway talks, and some of the people in the room has been involved in that. Um, there's different ways that you can kind of, somebody's a new eyes, new perspective, and it can be very helpful in this process. So the last step here is analysis in action. We're gonna go to three different 
parts here, and with each of your visualization, you might not do every single one of these, but we're gonna break it down. So with this first one, we wanna determine if this metric follows what is currently known about your community. So if it does, great, but let's make sure that to, to take a step back and see if there was any assumptions made whenever you were generating this metric that made it align to what you had already known about your community. It's a good time to just do a little bit of a sanity check to make sure that maybe some of your internal biases was not like integrated into this visualization. And if it doesn't align with your prior knowledge, you have two things that you need to consider. One, was there a data or calculation issue here? Do you need to have someone to go through and really di digest the code that you have made or the data collection? Make sure there was no problems here. Or was this a priorly misunderstood part of your community? Is this something that is bringing in an entirely new insight and you kind of have to take a breath and realize that maybe something wasn't known the way that wasn't exactly how you had known it before. The second part here is implementing community initiatives. Now that you've digested all of this data analysis, you can start to determine different community initiatives that you want to attack with the insights you've been given. And here's where you would want to determine measurements of success, a lot like how we went into in that second scenario. Last one here is observing com um, community initiatives that have been informed by the metric or whenever you generated a metric around it. Um, if there's a case where this impact is not observable, there's a couple things you might wanna consider. One, are you measuring the right thing? Is there an initiative happening and there are impacts there but you're not looking in the right areas whenever you're doing your analysis? Or is there a initiative strategy that needs to be tweaked a little bit to actually get the results that you're hoping to receive. So, I just talked a lot about a bunch of high level things. Let's go into an actual example of this workflow. So, this our example analysis area is going to be new contributors. I wanna learn more about our new contributors and what their activity is. So, first I'm gonna start with my magic eight ball question. What do I wish I knew if I could get a straight answer right away? In this scenario, I want to know if people are having an experience that converts many to being a consistent contributor. So what data do I have that could go into this analysis area in the magic eight ball question that I've proposed? For me here, I'm look I wanna look directly at the contributor activity around repos with timestamps. That's kind of my, little, my data area that I'd like to go into here. Now with the data in our magic eight ball question, let's break this up into subparts and see each of them to the end. I'm gonna, with those couple of different parts, we're gonna go question by question, just so we can stay on one train of thought. So one of the first ones, let's start with how are people coming into their community? Looking at new contributors, let's see what action they do first. Are they opening an issue? Are they making a comment? Are they doing a PR? So the visualization that I'd make here would be first time contributors, like their action broken down by quarter. So say we have a bar chart and two first time contributors did an issue. So you see a little issue and then on top, maybe one did a PR. And so that would be something how that would look like. Um, so I go and I have this visualization and maybe I go talk to a colleague and we come up with an extension. Um, what's a little bit further breakdown? How about what if for first time contributors, we broke it down to see if there was a difference between the actions if somebody was a repeat contributor or a drive-by contributor. So you can kind of see those two graphs next to each other. Let's see if what people are doing when they come in when they're just a drive-by or a fly-by, or if they're coming in and becoming a repeat or active member, are those first actions different? Um, and some potential actions that could be, performed, um, could be informed by this is maybe something along the lines of, does our current documentation support our contributors for whatever the top the top um, first action is by repeat contributors. Like whenever somebody becomes an active member, are we supporting what is the most likely first action? Um, is there a contributor area that is not common overall, but is a good sign for someone to be an active contributor? 
let's say in this example, um, PR is the most common for repeat contributors, but not for flyby. Could we maybe label good first issues in our contribution documentation? Would that be able to hold, help? Or maybe adding some form of like a PR buddy for first time, first time people opening a PR. These are different ideas here. Um, we can go and break down another sub question. Another one it came up with is, what is the conversion rate from first time contribution, somebody make one contribution, to an active or repeat contributor? We'll kind of, since we went into repeat a lot in the last one, let's just go with active. And that is somebody, we'll just say, has made a contribution in the last month. Um, we can make a metric saying, okay, what percent of those first time contributors actually get converted to a active community member? And some questions that we could ask around this is that, is this number of percent going up or down? Is there something that we did in the past, maybe a year ago, whenever this, this number was higher, that we're not doing now? Was there an initiative that changed? Is there something that we can learn from what we've done in the past? Or is there a trend for the ones that are sticking around? Are they getting more communication from current members and support? Are whenever they're first time or early um, on community members, are there issues in PRs getting um, the attention quickly? And one last example we'll go through here is, is our code base really dependent on drive-by contributors? Maybe I wanna see what number of, con of what our contributions are looking like for each of the breakdown. And a real question we can look at here is just, is this a ratio that we like? Is there a lot being done by drive-by? Is there an underutilized resource that we're not doing our part of bringing in? So from here, uh, we're gonna start breaking down the analysis lessons learned and the scope that I would love everyone here to leave with today whenever they're considering doing community metrics. So first one that I will say is numbers in data analysis are not facts. They can, we can make them say anything, and the internal skeptic should be alive as well, and well whenever you're looking at somebody else's metrics or your own. The iterative process of really considering what you're, um, how you're looking at your data is what's going to bring value. You don't want your analysis just to be a yes man of, your, of the beliefs that you have hold. Take time to take a step back and truly in, um, evaluate the assumptions that you've made. So, and if a metric just points at a direction to investigate, that is a huge win. You can't look at everything and think of everything off the bat. And if a graph just brings you down a rabbit hole that you wouldn't have thought of before, that's a good thing. A conversation starter alone can bring you to a new place. And let's be honest here. Sometimes the exactly what you want to measure is not there but it might bring, be able to bring valuable pieces of the puzzle. With that, you can't assume that you have every piece of the puzzle to get the exact answer to your original question. If you start to force an answer or solution, you can re lead yourself down a pretty dangerous path led by your assumptions. And leaving room for your path, for your path or goal of analysis to change can lead you to a better place or insight than your original idea did. And here we're gonna go into data analysis. It's really just not, it's the start, not the solution. Each of the scenarios that we went through today is starting at different points of the data science workflow, or the, specifically the workflow for defining uh, metrics. The first one we went into was that second go around of um, data analysis when you started to bring in more people and more insights from others. The second one is whenever you had your goals and scope established, you knew what you wanted to look into. And the third one was coming in at a completely new idea, building from scratch. You should never stop asking if there's more context needed or if this is truly answering the questions that you want. And there is so much going on, whether it be data, other community responsibilities, if we can cut down the amount of time that it takes to get information or make an, it's an easy system to check this on a regular cadence, this is a huge win for any community member, especially your community architects. 
think about how much this can be used to inform the way you think about the community, even if it's not a direct conversation about the, co the topic or metric. And this makes it sustainable. Ten to five to 10 minutes every week to check something is much more realistic to, to many hours looking into it. So here's some of my closing thoughts. Data is a tool, it's not the answer. But it can, bring us, it can bring together insights and information that would not have been accessible otherwise. Methodology is the most important part of this. And breaking down what you want to know into manageable chunks and building on top of that. And taking a step back from open source data analysis, this is all a great example of the care that needs to be taken into account for all data science. You must take into account the nuance of the topic area and we all know that open source community has a lot of nuance. Um, the process of look, working through what to ask and what answers you want is often overlooked. And this is where really some truly insightful and innovative process can come in, which is much more important than any specific tool that you use. And today, if you are a community member with no data, ex data science experience and looking for a place to start, I hope that this can show you how important and valuable you are and your insights is to this process. We have to have people who truly understand the community, in this case our data area, to be able to make really great visualizations that are not go based off of incorrect assumptions. And if you're a data scientist or someone implementing these metrics or visualizations, you have to listen to the voices around you even if you're also an active com um, community member. And so, thank you very much. Um, whenever, <laughs> I'm gonna put up on the screen as well some examples of actual implementations of some of these visualizations. And um, I actually wanna take a second to take a step back and establish what has happened today. Um, I would really love to urge everyone in this crowd to donate to your local abortion fund today, and there's many people who are going through a very rough time. Um, please support the people you love around you, and if someone, if you or someone you know needs help getting access to abortion today, tomorrow, or any day after, please reach out to me. Thank you. get this data analysis on the screen and we can go for questions. Actually it isn't, it's Dash. <laughs> yes, back to my argument that tooling, everyone's choice. But yes, opening up for questions. Hi, uh, thank you very much for this because I am responsible for spinning up an OSPO at a new startup mm -hmm. and we're going to be measuring a lot. And so this context is, feels much more like um, repos that we already own and measuring community involvement. Would you use the same methodologies for tracking staff members' c contributions to upstream communities? Because that's a metric I'm being asked to track for our management to justify funding as we go through uh, different rounds of funding as a startup. Yes, absolutely. I think that goes into well, like the whenever you're considering your perspectives, there you're trying to show your business impact to advocate for working with open source communities. And so I think this all this methodology really applies to that. Thank you very much. I think, I think the data analysis that you've shown makes a ton of sense for like a single repository that you're trying to manage. Mm -hmm. For folks that are trying to aggregate across many repositories, what are, what, what about this do you think changes? I mean, certainly the methodology is probably the same, but in terms of how you think about metrics, like a flyby contributor for the Linux kernel is probably very different than a random NPM module. And so, in aggregate, how are you thinking? How, how would you think about contributions in that in that view? 
Yes, so when building like a lot of these visualizations that I'm building, it's supposed to be used for multiple different sides of communities. So here, I think it's important to, like I think the first example for the drive-by and contributors per quarter, having a, the ability to change what that threshold is, is really important. So for a smaller community, maybe four or five contributions would um, warrant somebody to be a repeat contributor versus maybe a really large one, that threshold is different. So I'd say that there's not going to be a one size fit all for different sizes of community or even if you're looking at different repositories. And so I think that's where the customiz like the customization really comes into play and can make it a lot more valuable. Because even you might not know, even for your own community, what that threshold is that makes it in a table like this really helpful. And so having that ability to change can really bolster it. Mm -hmm. If you had to blend one, like, instead of, like, if I have 100 repositories that I need information on, looking at 100 different variations of this would be very difficult. Um, do you have any, like, I don't know, like, data science intuition around, like, blend, blending that in a way that would make sense? Does, the, does that question? Yeah. yeah. So for this tooling that we've created, actually, we have, like, a search bar above, which allows for you can look at an entire organization, or in, maybe your repos aren't in an entire organization, but you can select all of them and see them, all that data grouped together, or you can start to deselect, so you can kind of see it, what does it, the entire aggregate look like, and you can compare it to like a singular repo. So I think that that context can be really helpful, so you can see what the average is like, and then see when you break it down to maybe one or two repos, a small portion, what the differences are. Thanks. I'm, I'm, this has um, been really great and got a lot of questions in my mind, but the, what, and was, what came up most this morning was like, what are my magic eight ball questions, right? And, and so like two examples would be like something like where, where are people falling down in the contribution process? Or how is it that you, how does an idea go from here to a feature that's completed on the other side? Like who are the individuals involved in doing that? Right? Like, who are the core maintainers? Who are the people that you need to make that thing go? And how do you, like, how will you find that? Right? So I'm just pausing that. Those are my magic eight ball questions. Yes. Do you have any? Where would where would you begin for trying to to parse through that kind of uh, come up with some more, somewhere to go and chase for that? I think the first, the next step there is really like going into okay, what data can we look at around this? Is going to always be that next step, and. It's gonna, it might not be something that you can come up with right on the spot. You might need to talk more to the community members around you, what data is available, and that's really where that brainstorming spot at the beginning is gonna be taking, you have to take that into account. And maybe it's a group of people who are community members and you wanna have somebody who has a little bit of data insight to be help curate that a little bit. And so I guess like the next step there would be trying to determine what data is available. Uh, so I was wondering, and I may have missed this because I came in a few minutes late. Um, it, it, what do you, what suggestions do you have for a new program uh, when data is so scarce? Do you have any thoughts on like what would be some magic eight ball questions initially? Hmm, that's a good question. So you're saying a new program as like an open source program offers or new repos? That's a really interesting question. I guess the first thing I would recommend going to is that maybe if you have other communities that are in the same, like similar like technology ecosystem or some communities you look at like, okay, this is something that I think is the right size, how the cadence work, I would really recommend going and talking to those people and kind of see, okay, what have you found that works and doesn't work? And if they're doing metrics and kind of see, okay, what, how can I take this and tweak it a little bit to work with my smaller community? So I think that 
it would be really good to establish like goals out front of what you would like to see from your community, how would you like to see people interact? And so then you can start to build those metrics and so you can see how that growth happens as in real time. There's nobody else. I, def I wanted to give a, a little bit of a quick plug. If you are an OSPO or a community architect or somebody who is trying to kind of take that first step to data analysis, you have your questions, but you're trying to figure out the tooling portion of it, um, please contact me. Um, I'm, we're working on a project at Red Hat called Project San Diego, and we're really trying to figure out what people want to see. What are the visualizations are important to their community? And we would love to help produce that and make some of these visualizations the ones that y'all would like to see. So I'll be putting my information up here. And please reach out to me, and I would love to work with y'all. Thank you.